Welcome to the Harnessing the Power of Your Vagus Nerve Masterclass, where you'll learn how to boost your immunity, heal your gut, and elevate your mood and brain health. I'm Dr. Peter Kahn, your host, and I'm a board-certified chiropractic neurologist and certified in functional medicine and integrative medicine. Since 2009, I have been working exclusively with people with chronic health issues, both neurologically and metabolically, and I have helped over 6,000 people overcome their chronic condition. In that experience, I have learned that the vagus nerve is one of the key missing pieces in why people are often stuck in their health plateaus. Now, let me ask you this. Do you or someone you know suffer from chronic health issues such as chronic fatigue, brain fog, short-term memory issues, depression, anxiety, restlessness? Do you or someone you know struggle with chronic immune system challenges such as chronic inflammation, chronic viral infections, chronic candida issues, parasites that you can't get rid of, or do you have some type of autoimmune disease or allergies? Or do you struggle with chronic gut issues such as gas, bloating, reflux, heartburn, constipation, diarrhea, perhaps, perhaps alternating constipation, diarrhea? Or do you struggle with food sensitivities, chemical sensitivities? Do you have conditions such as SIBO or candida overgrowth or some type of autoimmune digestive issues such as Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or celiac disease. You see, underneath all of these issues, the vagus nerve is a key player that could be either a contributing factor or the root cause of the problem, or these diseases can actually start to impact the vagus nerve and cause it to start to dysfunction and create other symptoms. So it becomes a vicious cycle. So it's so, so important to learn why this is important. So what's the big deal with vagus nerve? Let's talk about it. So we have vagus nerve. Let's go this way here. We have actually the brain. Let's start here. We have the immune system and we have the gut. And as I talked about in many previous uh, master classes, that the brain is communicating with the immune system. The immune system is communicating with the gut and the gut is communicating back up to the brain. And in fact, this is actually a bi-directional two-way communication. So in effect, the immune system is communicating with the brain, the brain's communicating with the gut, and the gut is communi communicating with the immune system. Now the way that works is that your brain, obviously through the vagus nerve, is gonna have innervations that's gonna talk to and communicate and innervate the gut to give it function. Now the gut, on the other hand, including the gut microbiome, which are those bacteria and organisms that are in your gut that's naturally there, also communicate back up to the brain, while the brain also has mechanisms to communicate with the immune system peripherally, and also in the periphery, if you have inflammation or you have infection, the immune system will make cytokines and messages that will come back up to the brain and tell the brain what to do and let the brain know that you know, you're in trouble. And then at the same token, the immune system is communicating with the gut, so that if you have some type of you know, inflammation or autoimmune issues or infections, the gut will know about it. And if the gut is in trouble because it's inflamed, then it's gonna signal the systemic inflammation or immune system so that your whole body becomes inflamed. So we have the situation where if your gut is inflamed, then you're gonna have systemic inflammation and then you're going to have brain inflammation. And that becomes a vicious cycle. So it's so common for people when they have chronic issues to struggle with these brain immune gut challenges. Now, with this brain immune gut challenge, turns out that the vagus nerve is actually playing an integral role in controlling function between all three systems. So essentially, the brain talks to the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve talks back to the brain, so it's a, again a two-way communication, the vagus nerve, many of you may be well familiar that it communicates with the gut, and the gut actually go ahead and comes back and communicate with the vagus nerve, which then the vagus nerve will go ahead and send that signal up to the brain about what the gut is up to. And then the vagus nerve also directly impact the immune system. And I mean directly, hardwire in a neural reflex. And at the same time, the immune system is gonna come back and talk to the vagus nerve. 
And then so when each of these things are connected, you can see how the vagus nerve is in the middle, mediating action between the brain, immune, and the gut. Now we can also really add the hormonal system here as well. So we have the brain, immune, gut, but really probably could have been a four-way instead of a triangle, could have been a four-way geometric shape where the endocrine system is going to have an impact with all these other systems as well. So essentially, instead of the brain immune gut axis, as I have always coined it, maybe it should be called the brain immune gut endocrine axis. So in that sense, instead of the big axis, now we have to call it the biggie axis. Um, no, no relation to uh, Biggie Smalls, uh, Notorious B.I.G., the rapper, but we have perhaps a Biggie axis. So in this masterclass, I'm going to take you for a journey, a deep dive, to really help you to master this information. Because if you can see the connection of how things are wired together, you are no longer confused by your symptom. You will have clarity, you will know why you're having issues, and it's no longer a mystery to you. You have a way to go ahead and reverse engineer it, so to speak, to kind of work your way back and solve your own health problem. This is empowerment. This is only going to come when you master this information. So in this master class, I'm not going to water things down. It's going to be mastery level information. And I know you can, you can get it because I'm going to speak to you in English in terminologies that you can understand so that you can actually understand really complex subjects like this but in an easy, easy to understandable way. Now, when you truly appreciate how everything works, it's much more likely that you're going to get better results because you're actually going to really appreciate this and also really stick to it, right? And follow through with the recommendations that, uh, you know, that we're gonna show you that you can take, partake in yourself. So hopefully this will help you. Now, the next step that we're gonna talk about is what is out there right now for vagus nerve? Many of you are coming to this master class. Perhaps you've never heard of the vagus nerve and you're wondering what it's about. You want to learn and you're in a great place. Maybe some of you have heard a few things about it. You heard the word vagus nerve, but you don't really know what it all does. This master class is going to be great for you. Some of you maybe have learned a lot through the years, through other summits and other online resources. Awesome. This masterclass is going to take you up another notch or several notches. And so this is going to serve all of you. The first thing I'm going to address is what's out there for vagus nerve, right? So we have conventional medicine. So in a conventional medicine model, the vagus nerve is usually not thought of. It's usually not considered. Okay, and what that means is usually when you go to the medical doctor and you complain of a cluster of symptoms, right, then what they do is they're going to attribute your symptom to some type of, you know, diagnosis. They're going to label it. Okay? And when that happens, basically the vagus nerve will no longer be in consideration because they're only going to attribute your problem to a set of symptoms which they can link to a diagnosis. So we have perhaps the vagus nerve is not functioning, that's leading to symptoms, and from the medical perspective, they're only gonna start the intervention here and only if they can give you a diagnosis. Because once they can give you a diagnosis, they can do either a drug or surgery for that diagnosis. Now, that diagnosis doesn't mean it's the right diagnosis. They can get it wrong too, right? Anybody can get it wrong, including myself. So what happens is the drugs and surgery are very invasive therapies that sometimes you can't undo. So we have to be very careful how we go about that, especially when we don't know the underlying root cause of the symptoms. So that's the problem with conventional medicine. Now, on the other hand, we have natural medicine. Now, natural medicine, typically natural alternative practitioner, they lack understanding 
and not just frank knowledge of how the vagus nerve actually works. They lack the anatomy, the neuroanatomy of vagus nerve. It tend to be very watered down and simplified. And so there's a lot of myth and misconceptions being pushed around, okay? being passed around. Myths and misconceptions. Okay, so what are some of these myths and misconceptions? Well, let's start with one of these myths and misconceptions. So we tend to think of the vagus nerve, which comes out of your brainstem, exit through the neck, going down through your GI tract and innervate the gut and the rest of the body. Uh, there's actually two vagus nerves, one on the left, one on the right. It's a paired nerve, paired cranial nerve. So the idea is that it's one nerve, or even one pair of nerve, is actually not accurate because the vagus nerve, as in many nerves in the body, if you see this as a nerve, okay, cut cross section here, inside the nerve we have tons of nerve fibers so these nerve fibers come out through here kinda like a big thick cable, okay, you have a cable with a bunch of wires in it, okay and each wire may be a wire for a specific signal for a specific function. So perhaps this particular wire will go to the gut, and perhaps this particular wire will go to the spleen. Perhaps this particular wire will go to your liver, and so on and so forth. So in effect, the vagus nerve is actually not one nerve, but rather 180,000 nerve fibers with perhaps distinct functions for many of these nerve fibers. So when I say 180,000, because there's a pair, right, you have a left and a right, each side, I should say 160, sorry about that, so each side will have 80,000, up to 80,000 in one side of the vagus nerve. So, you know, you, it's not that you can just push a button and everything gets turned on. It's not that simple. Okay, so myth number two is that the vagus nerve is controlling parasympathetic function only. And that's also a, a mistake to think that it just does parasympathetic. Of course, it's a very con important contributor of parasympathetic function. And I'll explain that in the following lessons. But it does much more than that. A big role that it plays, as I mentioned, is that it actually has a huge role in controlling your immune system function. So if we just think, that, think of this as simply, oh, I'm stressed, so therefore I have parasympathetic issues, then we can miss a lot of opportunity to actually make this thing better. Myth number three is that, that there's this idea that you could just um, you know, push a button, okay, push a button to reset the nerve. Okay, like if you could just stimulate the vagus nerve with a boom, and then the vagus nerve would just come back to life and everything's gonna be fine. That's simply not accurate. Now, I don't want to undermine the power of stimulating the vagus nerve because that's a very powerful thing that you can do when you can stimulate that. But you still need to identify the root cause of why the vagus nerve is dysfunctioning in the first place, All right? So we need to identify the root cause of the root cause, as I always say, right? Go a few layers deeper until you can't go any deeper, then you have reached the actual root cause, right? The, the upstream problem. So sometimes the vagus nerve's not working right because something is opposing it or stressing it. For example, toxins or infections or blood sugar issues. These things can definitely hamper vagus nerve function. So even if you stimulate the vagus nerve and that's very powerful, that may not do it in every single person, right? So it's not fair to people to tell them that, oh, just stimulate the vagus nerve and everything's gonna be okay. Because sometimes it's not okay. Sometimes you have other things you need to attend to as well. So we're gonna talk about vagus nerve, but I'm also gonna share with you the key to resetting the vagus nerve, which is this brain immune gut axis, or now we're gonna call it the biggie axis now, okay? So with that said, it's important for you to get the basic 
anatomy and physiology down, right? So now we're going to get into some the mitty grit and the, the meat and potatoes of it. Because if you don't know the anatomy, you can't visualize where things are. So what happens is we say vagus nerve, all these different function, it's just a bunch of words to you that doesn't really have much meaning. Okay, so I'm gonna take you for a deeper dive into the actual structure and function of the vagus nerve so that you can really master this information and harness the power of your vagus nerve. Okay, now let's have you meet Jane. And Jane, please meet everyone. Now, Jane has volunteered to give us her anatomy so we can study from it. So we have the face, throat, lung, liver, gallbladder, stomach, heart. We have the pancreas with the spleen. We have the small intestine, large intestine, bladder, sex organs. So this is all represented here. So the way it works is that we have the autonomic nervous system, which is the part of the nervous system that control, controls everything on autopilot. Now, this is pretty basic for you. Stick with me because I got some major clinical pros coming up. Okay, now for those of you who are new to this, again, the autonomic nervous system controls all bodily function that's on autopilot. And we have two main branches. We have the parasympathetic nervous system and we have the sympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic is a part of the nervous system that makes you go. So it's represented in green, like green light. And parasympathetic nervous system is a part of the nervous system that makes everything slow down or your stoplight, right? So we have the go, and gas pedal, and brake pedal, and they work in tandem, in balance. Now, the function that they control, so the sympathetic is going to cause your pupils to constrict or to dilate, I'm sorry to dilate the pupil so you can let more light, light in. Because the sympathetic nervous system, when it fires, it's also part of your fight or flight response. When you're under stress, you need to see danger, you need to see if there's a predator coming for you or anything like that. So you dilate your pupil, it'll make your saliva glands dry up, dryness in the mouth. Okay? In the lungs, the sympathetic's gonna cause bronchial dilation because when you're fighting a tiger or running away from a danger, you need more fuel, so by opening up the lung, you can let more oxygen in, which gives you more energy. Makes sense. The sympathetics for digestion is that it's gonna stimulate bile flow. Uh, I'm sorry, it's gonna inhibit. It's gonna inhibit. It's the opposite, okay? Inhibit secretions. So it's gonna inhibit secretions of bile, gastric acid, and pancreatic enzymes. Because when you're trying to run away from a tiger, it's not really that important to digest food. And the sympathetic nervous system is also gonna slow down decreased motility. Because digestion is gonna be compromised when you're having sympathetic fight or flight response. So if these slow down, what gets activated? Well, what should be drawn here is a muscle. So we should have a... That's biceps. So sympathetics will divert blood, will give blood to muscles. And so you can fight or flight. It will also inhibit sex organs and also your urination and elimination. On the other hand, parasympathetic is gonna cause the pupils to constrict. It's gonna cause you to secrete more saliva. In fact, it's going to cause you to secrete all of your digestive secretions. Increased digestive secretions. By the way, the parasympathetic is also going to slow down the heart, decrease heart rate, while the sympathetic is going to have the opposite effect on the heart. Now, the parasympathetic is also going to increase motility It's also going to facilitate urination and bowel movement. Right? It's going to increase those things. And it's going to increase sexual function okay? while the sympathetic is going to inhibit it. So this is how it, these autonomic nervous system control many, many different diverse functions in the body. So why is it that you need to know this? 
because when you know this, it's important to know so that you know if your symptoms or your condition may have an autonomic nervous system involvement. Because if it checks the box where, yep, my pupils dilated, how would that feel like? Well, you might be sensitive to light. Light sensitivity, where bright light bothers you, maybe because your pupils are constantly dilated because your sympathetic is firing. And then on top of that, you say, oh, I have dry mouth all the time. And on top of that, you might have a decreased bile secretion, so you can't digest fat. You may have decreased gastric acid secretion, so you can't break down protein. You may have decreased pancreatic enzyme secretion, so then you don't digest food. So you get like bloaty and gassy. You can see undigested food in your stool. You have a decreased motility, so you feel constipated. And then you may have trouble with urination. You're, you're just not going very well. You're, or you're, you're constipated, as I say, and your libido's down, or your sexual function is not going good. So if you check all these boxes, then you might be able to say, okay, I'm not crazy. I don't have 10 problems. I have one big problem, which is my autonomics not working. I'm stuck on sympathetic, right? So that's important for you to recognize these. This is so useful for you to know this, like down cold. Okay? So these are the functions that they control. Now, where does this vagus nerve stuff come from then? Because if it's so important, they innervate all these different organs. Where does it come from? Well, here's your brain. And this is a brain facing this way, by the way. So if we were to draw the nose and mouth. The brain is in the skull facing this way. And the brain has a brain stem that looks like this, has three bulges. And in the back, you have the cerebellum. This is your cortex, or cerebral cortex. And this is what we call the brain stem. Here's your spinal cord, and you have the nerve root that innervate every single part of the body. So where does this cranial nerve come out of? The cranial nerve, vagus nerve, specifically, comes out of this region of the brain stem called the medulla oblongata. And cranial nerve, vagus nerve, the Latin for this, the root word is vagabond. Vagabond means a wonder because this vagus nerve is really long. It goes from the brain stem all the way down, all the way through, has branches that come out, innervate these organs. So that's why it's traveling, wandering nerve because it's very long, the vagus nerve. It's cranial nerve number 10. Okay, there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. So it's a paired nerve. So you have a left and a right. They go down the neck on either side. They kind of squash between your arteries and your veins, like your jugular vein and your carotid artery. And then so this vagus nerve come out of this area. So then they, then they have branches that goes to your heart, to your di to liver, to all these branches that you're seeing here. So the question is, does vagus nerve fire on its own? Does vagus nerve take its cue from anywhere else? Well, the answer is yes. The vagus nerve takes its cue from the cortex. So that means the brain has to fire to get the vagus nerve to work, right? So it's kind of like, who's the boss to tell the vagus nerve what to do? It turns out to be a cerebral cortex. Now, why is that important? Because a lot of times people think like, can I just stimulate the vagus nerve? Can I just stimulate the vagus nerve? Well, what if the problem is coming from up here where this is not working? Then you can stimulate the nerve and it may not do very much. You may have to improve cortical function so then how do you know if you have cortical problems, brain symptoms? Well, you know that if you have actually symptoms that's brain related. That would be things like brain fog, short-term memory loss, depression, anxiety, difficulty focusing. You feel like you have ADHD or adult ADHD or ADD. You have low motivation. You walk into a room, you forget why you walk in there in the first place. You forget words. You can't connect the dots. You know, when you say things, you, you know, your thoughts just kind of the train of thought just leaves you. It's like, oh, what, what was I talking about? These symptoms can be a cortical issue, that you have brain dysfunction, and then that cannot, therefore, innervate the vagus nerve. Now, know that 90% of the cortical output, what the brain produces in signal that goes down to the body to tell the body what to do, 90% of the output goes to this area called the PMRF. The PMRF is called a pontomedullary reticular formation, long word. Basically, it's just this part of the anatomy. And that PMRF is where a lot of your autonomic nervous system control is, vagus nerve being one of them. So again, people think that vagus nerve is the only thing that controls parasympathetic function. That's it. 
That's not true. There's other cranial nerves, such as cranial nerve number five, seven. They also control parasympathetic function, specifically in the face. Okay, these cranial nerves exit the skull and enter the face. The face. So you have other cranial nerves that control parasympathetic function, more specifically in the face, like tearing and sal saliva production and so forth. That's parasympathetic, mediated by mostly other nerves. You also have sacral in the sacrum, down by your tailbone. You have your sacral parasympathetic that will actually innervate your bladder and your sex organs. Okay, so you have other parasympathetic nerves. But the vagus nerve is a big deal because 90% of the brain's output or 90% of the parasympathetic function is actually transmitted by the vagus nerve. So even though it's, this is not the only nerve that transmit parasympathetic function, a majority of the parasympathetic signals are transmitted by the vagus nerve. So you can see that if the vagus nerve is not working properly, you can really lose a lot of this parasympathetic function which can start to create this imbalance. Okay, so that's really important to understand. Now, so that, that's called presynaptic input, by the way. So what that means is, what is coming before the vagus nerve, which is the cortex itself? And how do you know if you have a brain problem? I just described to you all those brain symptoms, brain fog, short-term memory loss, depression, anxiety. If you have those brain symptoms, you got a brain issue that may need to be addressed as part of fixing the vagus nerve, okay? Now, the next thing is you gotta understand the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, they're like the yin and the yang, okay? Which means that they're both working at the same time. One of the myth or misconceptions people have about the vagus nerve is that they think that it's only one or the other that's working at a time. Like you're either fight or fly sympathetic or you're parasympathetic, rest and digest. And there's no in between. That's not true. It's actually a spectrum. Okay, your body's constantly shifting between sympathetic and parasympathetic, so you may have like 70% sympathetic function when you're really stressed and 30% parasympathetic still there pushing it. And then when you're really relaxed, you might have like, you know, 60, 70% parasympathetic, and then 30, 40% sympathetic is still firing. So they're constantly pushing and pulling like the yin and the yang, so they're both working kind of at the same time, but they're both still antagonistic to each other. So think of this like a teeter-totter. Okay, so we have a teeter-totter, okay? So it can be like this, or it can be like this, right? So what that means is if you push down here really hard, this side's gonna go up. If you push down here really hard, this side's gonna go up. So if you really dampen or inhibit or stop the parasympathetic, your sympathetic, the fight or flight response, will work, I'm out of frame there. So if you really push down on the parasympathetic, then the sympathetic, here's para, sympathetic, and here's your sympathetic. If you inhibit this side, this side will get more active. If you inhibit the sympathetic, on the other hand, then the parasympathetic will become more active because they're antagonistic to each other, okay? But know that they're both working all the time at the same time. It's not that, oh, let me just shut off the sympathetic altogether because sympathetic nervous system function is not bad. See, sympathetic and parasympathetic, fight or flight or not fight or flight, none of this is bad. No, there's no value judgment. The, the, the judgment there is what we place on it, right? To describe these, to put in a story so you understand it. But this is a natural body response to have fight or flight. In fact, it's not really, it shouldn't really be called fight or flight. It really just should be called action response. Because without sympathetic, you wouldn't get out of bed. Without sympathetic, you wouldn't be able to be motivated to do stuff. You wouldn't have any energy. So you need sympathetic just at the right time and the right place in the right context is what's important. And also the right balance, the right amount of it, right? If you have way too much of it, then what happens is it's gonna predominate, then you're gonna to start to have skewing or imbalance of the symptom that we described earlier. Maybe your digestion will be off. Now on the other hand, you can have way too much parasympathetic, right? Which can, it's possible where you don't have enough sympathetic, then that will be a person who's just not going at all, right? So it's all about balance. Now, more frequently, clinically speaking, from experience, just looking at people that we, we, I've worked with, over 6,000 people now, that more often than not, it's the parasympathetic that's insufficient. So therefore, because vagus nerve is 90% not parasympathetic, there may be a decreased vagal tone that's leading to a loss of parasympathetic 
function or less of it, and that's allowing the sympathetic to predominate. Okay, now the area in the brain, by the way, where the sympathetic comes from is actually right here. So the parasympathetic is a little bit lower, and the sympathetic starts up here in this part of the brain. And that part of the brain is called the, I'll write it here, mesencephalon. Okay, technical term, but another name for that is called midbrain. So what we have is a situation that you can have midbrain mesencephalon over firing. So this literally comes from the brain itself that's firing too much sympathetic signal that can drive this fight or flight response. So that's a scenario. And then, so when we have the midbrain over firing, then we're basically having the sympathetic on too hard and therefore we're gonna dampen the parasympathetic. So that's very possible. So understanding that sympathetic and parasympathetic symptom that I described earlier will help you to understand if this is happening to you, okay? Now, another thing that's uh, that it's part of this is that we have heart rate control by this parasympathetic and sympathetic. So it's usually thought of with the heart rate that you think your heart rate is beating 60 beats per minute and it's beating very equally like this. But when in reality, your heart rate is beating fast and then slow. And then fast and then slow. And this is called heart rate variability, meaning the, the rate the speed at which your heart beats is actually variable. It's not steady one second per beat, but rather it can speed up to 80 beats per minute, and then it can slow down to 50 beats per minute. And then so then if you average that out in a 60 second time frame, you're gonna be somewhere in the middle. So your heart rate might be 65 or something like that. Now this heart rate variability turn out to be something that when you have high heart rate vari variability, this is actually an indication of good parasympathetic function. Okay. So this is something that can be measured. There are many devices that measure this now, and it's a very good assessment of your parasympathetic function. Not necessarily your vagus nerve function, just your overall parasympathetic. But understand that the vagus nerve is 90% of it is probably a good representation, okay? So now we talked about that's one way to kind of assess what are some of the other ways for you at home to know some of these things? Well, there are physical signs and there are symptoms, okay? Signs and symptoms. Now, symptom-wise, we already talked about it, right? So, symptom. And signs. So, symptoms are things that you feel. What you feel, right? Pain is a symptom. Headache is a symptom. Fatigue is a symptom. Numbness, tingling is a symptom. Indigestion is a symptom. A sign is something that you can see, that you can measure or observe, right? Like heart rate or blood pressure, right? That's something you can measure or observe. Blood pressure is not a symptom. Blood pressure is a sign or measurement, right? So symptom-wise, we already kind of covered it, right? By understanding sympathetic and parasympathetic, what they do to each part of these organ, you can get an idea like, oh, I get it, sympathetic fight or flight, so dilate pupil, might be more light sensitive. Uh, you might even become more sound sensitive because that mesencephalon we talked about earlier, that's right here, is where light and sound, once it enter your eyes and your ears, finally ends up in this area of your brain. So if the mesencephalon is already way over firing, way too hyperactive, firing off fight or flight response, you may be becoming more sensitive to bright lights, that your pupils dilated, more lighted, and that area, that brain is already flooded with that signal, so it can't handle any more, so you become sensitive to bright lights. And also sound, you might be sensitive to loud noises, and you know, sudden noises, banging noises, or loud environment, it just bothers you. You know, makes you averse to it. That could be a high-firing mesencephalon. You may have dryness, dry saliva. You don't produce, uh, you know, uh, uh, tears. Um, you may have, you know, sometimes people have fast heart rate, right? So we talk about your heart rate or your heart rate variability may be low. You're just beating fast all the time like this, but there's no variability in it, which indicates less of a parasympathetic. You may have digestion issues, right? These are all signs of a either a high-firing, high-sympathetic, 
or low parasympathetic, right? Could be like, so which one is it? So that's where we have to gather more data, right? This is where lab tests or physical exam and other things can come into play to help us decide, is it too much a fight or flight response, too much sympath sympathetic or not enough vagal tone, or is it both? Now, symptom, again, we covered that earlier. So what are some of the signs? So the signs could be HRV, as we talked about. Uh, low HRV could be a sign of poor parasympathetic. Many times we can uh, look at palate. Now this may require a physician or somebody with experience. If you look at the back of your throat, when you say, ah, ah, you're looking for the back of your, you know, the top of the roof of your mouth to lift up. There's muscle there called the palate muscles. And if that muscle doesn't lift up as well, that's you know, can be seen as a weakness, right? Now, it doesn't mean paralysis. If you have paralysis where it's not moving at all, that, that may be some type of neurological damage. Go see a neurologist. But if you have some kind of weakness where it's just not lifting up as strongly, that could be indicating a decreased vagus nerve innervation to that area because remember the throat from Jing? The vagus nerve innervate the muscle in the throat to help you with swallowing. So the, the, the muscles, the swallowing reflex, the gag reflex, these are all controlled by the vagus nerve. So that gives us also an entry point to stimulate the vagus nerve, right? And you see the ear here? There's actually a branch here in the ear that is a sensory nerve called the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, which innervate this small part of the ear that actually is a sensation that you're, you, you can feel by touching it. And that, uh, again, gives us a window into stimulating the vagus nerve. So we'll talk about that later on in this master class. So what are other signs? We talk about paletoparesis, which means the inability to lift the palate or weakness thereof. Uh, there's also uh, listening to the gut, right? Remember the vagus nerve promote motility. So if you listen to someone's tummy, like you can just use your ear or doctor's office will use a stethoscope, but you can just put the ear on someone's tummy and if you, he, if you hear, you know, the tummy's making noises, it's normal for the tummy to make noises, right? That's part of the motility. So you'll hear these gas bubble noises. Bloom, 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 about that frequency. That's pretty normal. If you put the ear on the tummy and you hear crickets, like nothing, or very slow, takes like forever before you hear something, then that can indicate decreased motility and that could be caused by a vagus nerve issue. So you can listen to the tummy noises, you can look at the heart rate variability, you can even measure blood pressure. If someone has very high blood pressure, it may be caused by a high firing sympathetic, although there could be other reason for the high blood pressure besides just a autonomic nervous system problem. So you can't just make that claim, right, without investigating other things. Same thing with heart rate. Just because somebody has a fast heart rate doesn't automatically mean that it's an autonomic nervous system problem because they may just have a heart problem. That's not part of the autonomic nervous system. But those are some of the physical signs. Now, we can also look at pupil, by the way. Now, this, again, may require a doctor who knows what they're looking at, but if we shine a light into a pupil and the pupil doesn't constrict very well, that may be a lack of sympathetics. Uh, we can also do a blood pressure response where you measure your blood pressure from seating to standing Typically, we want to see that blood pressure raise about by about 10 millimeter mercury. If it doesn't go up, because when you stand up, you need to have higher pressure to get the blood to your brain so you don't get dizzy, that's a normal response. But if you get up and the blood pressure doesn't raise by quite 10 millimeter mercury, then that may indicate a decrease autonomic response or it could be adrenal issue or some other issue. Again, these are clues that we gather, right? We never, as I always teach, we never hang our hat on just one test. We're always looking at multiple markers to build a case to confirm, to solidify our diagnosis so that we know we're right and we're not just guessing, okay? So this is uh, uh, just a kind of an introductory to the anatomy and physiology of autonomic nervous system function, sympathetic, parasympathetic. I think knowing this down pack will really help you to be able to identify in yourself to see if this th there's an autonomic nervous system involvement and therefore to streamline your thought process about what to focus on. Now in the next mastery session, we're going to talk about specifically vagus nerve and gut function. See you there.